Hi, uh, my name's Tom Mayers, and uh, I'm uh, giving a talk to the Longbow Key Garden Club. And uh, I have a long background history here on Longbow Key. I was uh, basically born and raised here. Uh, I was born in Tampa, but this was our beach house. So uh, in my family has a history that goes back a hundred years uh, on Longbow Key uh, or more. And um, my great uncle had the first mail boat that came down from Tampa that carried uh, lumber and uh, fruit and vegetables and uh, people from Tampa to Sarasota on a regular basis. So, uh, so I have a long history here and uh, I have a background in environmental studies. I uh, worked at, uh, well, I went to the Florida State University, I went to uh, University of South Florida, and I went to New College, but New College was the main college I went to. Uh, I graduated with, from New College with a degree in environmental studies. And in order to get that at the different schools, I did the whole uh, biology 101, 102, 103. I did zoology 101, 102, 103. I did the botany 101, 102, 103, ecology 101, 102, 103, and then also studied field botany and Shakespeare and Immanuel Kant and all the different things that you do at a liberal arts college you study. But uh, this is what you're seeing now are flowers and pictures that I took uh, while I was working for Michael Saunders and Company. Michael Saunders is my sister. And she had the foresight to uh, say, hey, Tom, while you're out taking pictures of houses, which I took thousands and thousands of pictures of houses, uh, he, she said, just take pictures of the flowers and of the animals and of the environment around where the uh, houses are, and we'll put them in a file and use them for just uh, general purposes. So uh, this is the... Uh, the fruit of that labor and uh, these are just flowers that were taken around houses that I was photographing and uh, some of the scenery. So when you're talking about flowers and, and uh, plants and gardening, you know, you have trees and you have bushes and you have plants, small potted plants and uh, plants in the yard. Some have flowers as the most uh, recognizable thing that people say, well, gee, that's a hibiscus because it has a beautiful flower, and others have no distinct flowers but have uh, more the leaves and the branches. So a combination of these things and what uh, is your interest and what you want to specialize in. Fruit is always a, uh, a good thing to have in your yard. If you like fruit, uh, this mango is, looks pretty good right here, and uh, that's a nice thing to have. And then we have citrus has been a big thing in Florida. We've always had lemons and limes and oranges and grapefruits and uh, papayas. And we're lucky to live in a, uh, in a um, basically a subtropical area. So just north of here, as, as you, soon as you get past Tampa Bay and start heading north, uh, you go from a subtropical environment to a temperate environment, and that in that temperate environment you have plants that aren't so cold hardy. But um, what you raise should be just uh, in your garden should be a matter of uh, you know your environment, what you have, whether you have a large yard or a small yard, or if you live in a condominium. Uh, look around and see what your neighbors are doing and what they have and I've always found it interesting to uh, to take and, and make cuttings of plants and uh, I had a interesting um, thing that I did one time where I took a boat and I made uh, it was an old boat that was not uh, of any use and I put holes in the bottom of the boat and I made uh, it so it would drain really well and then I put uh, wood shavings in the boat and uh, an irrigation system and then sliding glass doors over the top. And that little boat produced 
just a huge amount of uh, of cuttings, and uh, I would just take the uh, branches uh, off of uh, you know some plants that were lent themselves to uh, making cuttings, and uh, I made a mostly hibiscus, aurelia, um, you know, crotons, and I made a whole nursery of it and sold sold plants out of it. So. You know, with the timer on the uh, irrigation system and the, uh, you know, uh, little plants coming up and just in a matter of months, these uh, branches that I would take off of, uh, of some plants and put it in this boat, it became my little, uh, my little cutting bed where I produced uh, a whole bunch of crotons and hibiscus. And so that's something fun to do if you want to try to reproduce plants but look around and see what your neighbors have and what you admire and if they grow from cuttings and great you know take some home stick it in a, a potting soil and, and try it and you know I had a, uh, a small nursery at one time where I based on my cuttings and, and different plants that I air layered uh, was uh, just a, a little nice hobby to have and I planted a lot of the plants around our property here on, on Longboat Key. So these photographs, some of these flowers are very, very small and uh, they're just very pretty and sometimes you can use your macro um, you know, setting on your camera to take close-ups and sometimes you don't even need it. And uh, so these different flowers, hibiscus, different types of hibiscus, uh, frangipanis, uh, all of these are uh, just ones that have been grown around here that I noticed in somebody's yard was blooming and, and doing well. So, you know, if you do that in your neighborhood and then ask, you know, if you can make cuttings off of somebody's crotons, like these crotons right here are very pretty. And uh, just uh, they have uh, different leaf shapes and colors, and of course they have flowers, but the flowers are not the most distinct thing. Just as you wouldn't really talk too much about the flowers on a fruit tree, although they are very pretty, um, you know, the, uh, the fruit is <laughs> what you talk about on the fruit tree. So all of these things can be a palette of colors in your yard, and you can... Uh, grow them depending on, on the, the area that you have and uh, whether it be a tree or a bush or a little potted plant it, it can certainly add to the environment around you and some of these like this is railroad vine this is a native plant so why would you consider native plants well I mean they probably have been here for a reason because they uh, seem to do well in this area and uh, this is just the, the light filtering through a leaf and, and, you know, daisies and, you know, just different things are going to be uh, appealing to different people. Some people, I've had people tell me that they hate crotons, you know, they can't stand them. I said, well, it's nice that you have an opinion, but, uh, you know, those are just uh, personal choice as to what you want. So um, whether you want to grow a tree for a tree, maybe you want a tree just for shade. And, uh, you know, the the um, the lines are blurred but between what's native and, and what's not native. You know, you have one plant, like an Australian pine, what everybody's declared war on and wants to destroy the Australian pine. Well, at one time, it was considered a sensible solution to too much sun. A uh, fast-growing tree that's easy to grow, and uh, my parents planted a lot, and so did John Ringling, and that was one of the things that made Longboat Key more habitable. And now, of course, there's a jihad against the uh, Australian pine, but right next to it, you know, people have Cuban laurels. So, I mean, what's it? You know, we just are, you know, uh, prejudiced about different countries or what? You know, I mean, uh, Cuban laurel is obviously, you know, from Cuba. You know, so there's lots of plants here that have a, a varied history and, and what's native and what's not native. It's, it's just really a matter of choice. It's almost like uh, straight leg pants and bell bottoms. I mean, at one time, 
one thing's going to be in favor and another time it's not. So right now, Brazilian peppers, you know, people uh, sometimes just want to hedge to block out a neighbor. Don't want to see, you know, cars driving by on the road. So certainly uh, in a Brazilian pepper, you wouldn't want to cut it down just because it's uh, from Brazil. You know, you might want to put something from Cuba in there. <laughs> So anyway, plants are just a fun thing, and, and it's, it's best if you keep it like that. And if you, you know, find someone else or a nursery that has things that, that you admire, bring them home and try them. Uh, you know, they have what they call Darwinian evolution, and, and if things don't make it in your yard, you know, you can try them again, but you might want to try something else. And you never know what your specialty is going to be. You may be a cactus person. There's lots of societies around Sarasota that are great for uh, getting into plants. There's the Sarasota Succulent Society. Here's a nice succulent bloom right here. And, uh, you know, that's a, uh, a nice little small society that you can go in and work with plants and work with other people who have interest, interest in succulents. I've been a member of the Sarasota Succulent. I'm a lifetime member. I've been a member since uh, like 1970, and uh, so it's a fun little place. Look it up and go find it. You know, it's a, a nice place to uh, look into. Um, you've got uh, right here Moat Marine Laboratory if you're interested in, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, marine plants. You can uh, go there. There's You can make herbarium specimens of algae which is really an interesting thing to do. And, uh, you know, that is a good resource is um, go to Moat Marine Laboratory and talk to them about that. And you can make actual prints and hang them on your wall. So these uh, different kinds of plants uh, are uh, Bird of Paradise, are um, always, you know, showy and nice. Roses, I planted roses. I decided I was going to give my mother a real nice present and I planted a rose bed for my mother and uh, I had a nursery and I was buying potting soil by the truckload. I used to get it from Stern's Potting Soil in Dover, Florida and they'd bring a truckload down to potting soil and it'd have dolomite and red ant preventative in it so that had additives and I was using it in my nursery, so I decided, well, hey, let's take half of a truckload and just make a big bed and give my mother some roses that she's always wanted. So I put down some uh, visqueen, and uh, I had, uh, you know, this uh, visqueen down to prevent the roots from coming up from the Australian pine, but then I wanted some drainage, so I put some holes in it. And, and, uh, you know, it, it was great for a year or two, and then next thing you know, I get uh, all the roses started dying. Well, the Australian pines roots found their ways, and they got into that bed and just totally took over the bed. And the roses just, of course, died of uh, malnutrition because the Australian pines had so taken over the bed. So. Uh, you know, those are some things you might consider. Uh, also, you want to look, if, you know, we're on a barrier island. You want to look, uh, this is Ternera. That's a beautiful native plant, flower. Uh, I've always liked that a lot. This flower right here, yellow, pretty. Um, so anyway, you know, it's just, uh, that's what I would suggest is just try different things. Consider where you live. You live on a barrier island. You have, um, you know, uh, different uh, considerations of, of where you have flood tide. And you have flood tide and you have salt water intrusion. So a lot of times that limits uh, what plants can grow where. And if you notice down in a low area of your yard that things are dying there, it might be because of extra high tide you get salt. And you get a super haley, you know, uh, halophytic situation where you have the uh, the salt that just seeps into the soil and, and makes the soil so that only plants can grow there. So uh, my specialty in plants is uh, not roses or frangipanis or any of these flowers I'm showing you, but it was a natural environment and I specialized in mangroves. So 
mangroves are uh, non-obligative uh, halof halophytes, which means that that they don't need the salt water to grow and the real explanation and it's still up for discussion here's a little weed look how pretty that is it's just a little weed bloom uh, but you know the uh, mangroves grow where they are and people are still trying to figure out why exactly they grow where they do and so the reason that most people think that they grow where they do is because nothing else can grow there. So it's just this competitive thing where the plants are constantly competing with each other. Uh, Australian pine does well because it's salt tolerant. Um, mangroves do well because they are salt tolerant. They've lived in an environment. Here's the crotons with the pretty little flowers that you hardly ever notice because you're so busy looking at the real big pretty leaves. So. Uh, Orchids, of course, you know, got Selby Gardens, you know, if you like orchids, you're interested in orchids, what a fabulous resource we have here. You know, to go to Selby Gardens and get, uh, be able to participate and, uh, you know, help as a volunteer and, and get familiar with, uh, you know, what they have. And the roses, you know, the roses, you go to uh, <coughs> the Ringling Home, the, the House of John back behind the Oslo. Begonias, begonias are beautiful. These, uh, you know, uh, begonias are, are fantastic looking plants and if you put them together in a large grouping they really can be a, a colorful addition to your yard. But if you want to see roses, go see the Rose Garden at the Ringling Museum. And it's back there by the house and it's uh, a very beautiful special thing and you know these are just pictures of grasses right here what you see is grasses and um, you know fabulous uh, for just looking at it I saw a hill in Central America that was just covered it was a, actually a ruin and uh, a temple and it was covered with these and uh, these you know bougainvilleas you know how fantastic are bougainvilleas you know they're great they're hardy uh, colorful. I've seen them all over the Mediterranean and all over uh, Mexico, Central America, and the palms. We have palm leaves that are fantastic that, that grow here. So a lot of these plants I'm sure you know, uh, some of them that I don't even know, you know, what uh, I've taken a picture of here, but they're, they're fantastic in their variety and uh, you know, it's just like a celebration of living here in, uh, in Sarasota. So uh, the reason I'm giving this talk to you is because Claire Gertz asked me to. So thank you, Claire, for inviting me. And in the past, I've talked to you about uh, a variety of subjects. I've talked to you about Lomboki history, about natural environments, archaeology, the uh, Native American background. Now look at a pineapple. Uh, a friend of mine said that it's hard not to grow a pineapple here in Florida. So if you want to try something that's just fun and uh, pretty, try a pineapple. Uh, you know, some of these are just, you know, indistinct flowers before they bloom. Rosemary, you know, things that you, uh, you know, just use, you can use in cooking. So all of these things are easily grown in this area and uh, you know, uh, these are some sort of pampas grass or something like that that has, uh, you know, just looks beautiful. This is salicornia. It's uh, mangrove related, but look how pretty the little flower is. And you can actually make a salad out of this and eat it. It's a salt, uh, you know, grows in the mangrove areas. So all of these are, are fun things to, to get into. If you can grow fruit, there's nothing more pleasing to watch, you know, limes come into their own on the tree and be able to pick the limes off your tree and let them grow the exact amount of time. And, and uh, lilies are very pretty, very fragrant. If you like the smell of them, they, they certainly are a nice fragrant. Uh, Japanese plums. We had a Japanese plum tree in our yard when I was a kid and it was great um, for us to enjoy uh, the Japanese plum. So 
you know, my interest in plants and native environments uh, has been something I've pursued all my life. This could be picture on Longbow Key, on Casey Key, on Siesta Key, on uh, Minnesota Key. This happens to be Longbow Key right here. You remember before that spit hit the, uh, the bridge, this could be Longbow Key right here. So all of these pictures I'm putting to show you what was here before we, you know, did all the development on Longbow Key. Sometimes a picture of nothing is one of the best pictures you can take. There's uh, the Sarasota shoreline. We're lucky to have some shoreline left that's undeveloped. Mangroves with uh, all the different things. Just a, a beach scene like this is pretty with the little shells and the birds that we have here are, uh, you know, we're blessed to have so many uh, interesting animals in this environment. So uh, obviously these pictures, some of you will remember these and uh, these are, if you go out east, it's a totally different world because then all of a sudden you're in freshwater communities and you have uh, alligators and you have, uh, you know, all kinds of things that are just not commonly seen here. But this is why I've been so intrigued with the mangrove trimming and native environments because it's given me the opportunity to get out and look. There's Longboat Key from Siesta Key in the distance there. There it is again. But uh, it's just uh, so much fun to see this. Longboat Key is known for its beaches. We used to have beaches that didn't have to be renourished. Now renourishment is a huge industry. Uh, native environments, again, you've got cabbage palm, the state tree, you've got longleaf pine, mangroves, more, you know, more mangroves. I have loads of pictures of mangroves, and out east they have horses. They have, uh, you know, horses and cattle, and uh, people didn't, don't realize that Florida was uh, cowboy country, so as much as the Wild West was cowboy country, you know, a lot of the cowboys were here in Florida. And beautiful freshwater scenes with oaks and and different things. And uh, again, Longboat Key from uh, Siesta Key. Sea oats are great. And one of the things about sea oats are they're real fast growing. So, you know, uh, some people don't want to wait around for 20 years to see a plant mature. By nature, uh, sea oats grow fast. Um, again, more native, native scenery. This was what a lot of Longboat Key looked like before they put up all the condominiums. Um, these scenes right here are taken out east, um, not so far east, but just as soon as you go uh, east of I-75, you begin to see all this beautiful nature. Uh, alligators, you know, alligators are everywhere. They uh, have uh, some of these pictures are a little distorted and not many of them, but it, it's just a problem we had in making this video. There's a red winged blackbird. This is a surprise group of fish just sort of came up. We have manatees here that swim in the bays and, um, you know, we should all be trying to protect what's left. And I think a lot of people come here and, and they don't know that, uh, you know, all of these things are native here and they're just kind of diminishing. Uh, pileated woodpecker, just a spectacular. Uh, one of the things that people put down as their biggest interest when they came to Florida was to see an alligator. So, you know, some of these things are not only just, uh, you know, interesting animals. Stone crabs, you know, the stone crabs, we have them right here in the bay and uh, they're... Uh, Great food, you can get them at a restaurant. They're one of the more expensive things. Deer, we used to have deer on Longboat Key, so that was a long time ago. Fox, there's Fox Street on Longboat Key, so there were foxes. And then you have cardinals, which are always uh, fun and interesting. And of course the rat, the lowly rat, is the bottom of the food chain. You know, there's an owl that would love to eat that rat. And uh, so that's what goes on, and, and uh, that's one of the reasons I found Florida and Florida environments so interesting. Um, Osprey, you know, sitting there staring at you. The 
freshwater turtles, you know, they're just uh, all over. Deer is something that you go east of I-75 and there's deer. This is a, a yellow corn snake that is a native in a tree. Uh, this is a, a little white heron that's back there, a snapping turtle. And, you know, this is a native Florida snapping turtle. And then snook. You have a lot of people interested in the snook if it's not just to eat them, you know, but to catch them. This is a black crested night heron living in the mangrove. So all of these things are right next to each other. You know, they. Uh, are environments that uh, all of these animals are enjoying, plus we enjoy them and we can look at the animals too. And these are white pelicans and there, there's a lobster. I caught that lobster. It was a 12 pound lobster. It's one of the biggest ones I've ever seen. Florida lobster. Baby raccoons, you know, they make a nest in a tree and they're survivors. They're, they're um, all, of, you know, they basically are arboreal they're, uh, they eat a variety of foods. So they're, they've just learned to survive in this situation. There's some little corn snakes, babies that uh, we found some eggs and hatched them. These are otters, you know, sister key used to be called otter key. And there was a, a large population of otters here, but with the humans, they just got wiped out. And uh, I remember as a kid even, you know, otters were something that there's a black snake and black snakes are still around because they're so fast. And uh, that's Coach Whip. There's one that almost beats the black snake in speed. And uh, there's a beautiful model holding a corn snake. She was doing a shot, um, you know, around Long Land's End at Longboat Key to, and uh, she posed with a snake. So that's a, a mangrove snake, and this is a egret right here. And these are all native. They were on Longboat Key, and I, I just try to tell people about this. These white pelicans are, are beautiful, and they migrate down here. We have lots of rattlesnakes on Longboat Key in the early days, and there's one hiding. So you can see how you can almost step on that in the woods. And then, of course, the deer. Um, you know, we definitely had deer and bear and other things on Longboat Key before they were hunted out. We have all kinds of spiders here, brown widows, black widows, you know. Um, there's a sandhill crane and it's baby and there's nothing much cuter. And then of course the peacock. And, um, you know, without getting into the politics, our answer to the peacock is the uh, spoonbill. Pretty fascinating, and the little squirrels there are everywhere, and they are survivors. And the honeybee, I used to have 40 hives of honeybees on Longboat Key. And uh, of course, you know, the little uh, insects that come to pollinate the flowers, and the uh, blue herons, sandhill cranes. I mean, what an interesting environment here. So, you know, I hope you all enjoy the different aspects of it. and. Uh, you know, Claire asked me to show you mostly uh, photos of flowers, and I, I, you know, tried to do that. And I do some animal rehab. Sometimes people bring baby coons to me, and I, you know, try to keep them alive and then let them go when they're... Uh, this is a, a little green heron and a blue heron, and they're uh, right down by your shore. And, uh, you know, a question would be, if you would uh, just, you know, think about uh, whether you want alligators on Longboat Key, uh, you know, why not? I mean, you know, that's a big question. Why not have small alligators on Longboat Key? It would make it more interesting. There's a, a you know, a lizard eating a, uh, a brown widow spider that I was photographing. Uh, you've got the horses and the horse seen out East. Rabbits, they used to have rabbits all over Longboat Key. Now not so many, but I think it's nice. There's a rattlesnake I caught on Longboat Key here and let it go in the woods. There's a ringneck snake. That's something you probably will see in your garden or your yard. They're common. The white pelicans. And uh, then we have, you know, just uh, white pelicans that are our season, you know, visitors here. 
And then uh, cormorants are always pretty and interesting. And, uh, so anyway, their manatees are here and uh, the uh, you know environment I grew up in is much different than what you have today. That's the house I grew up in. This was some exploration trips my dad and mom made. That is Longboat Key. That's what it looked like here a long time ago. My great uncle John Sabres was one of the early settlers here. My parents, that's right at the north end of Longboat Key. It's a famous picture of my dad throwing the cast net. And uh, it's my dad, he ran a business here for a while and it was his dream to retire to Longboat Key. My had his father and his uncle were priests down in Barbados and the boat belonged to John Savory's right there. My sister Joan was a beauty queen and she was Miss Longboat Key, Miss Manatee County. John Savory's founded the Italian American Club and uh, that's John Savory's right there in Tampa back in 1900. And that's the little house and cottage my parents uh, built for us to live in and that's an early picture of the property. So I'm just trying to give you some background. I think a lot of times people are like talking heads. They get up and they just talk and you say, well, who is that and where were they from? Well, this is where I'm from. And uh, this is me with my family right here, my sister Michael, and I'm sitting on my dad's shoulder. And that's the business we ran. Look at the beautiful tomatoes that we had for the hamburgers. And that was our house when there weren't so many houses here. Uh, this was where my great uncle's boat came, Long Beach, right in the village, uh, right not so far from Claire's house here. And uh, it used to bring uh, passengers to and from. And our little house has been there. There's my sister, Michael, and she was, uh, you know, we people asked me what we did when we were kids, and I told them we swam and we fished, you know. So that's what we did when we were kids, and uh, and we sailed and boated and probably got too much sun. Uh, but that's my great uncle's boat right there, and I think he had one of the cutest boats uh, in 1900. <laughs> you know, he, he certainly opened this area up and did a good job of opening it up to exploration. And City of Sarasota was the name of, of the mistletoe when it was renamed. So there it is, is the mistletoe. And the white boat you saw earlier was the version of the city of Sarasota. There it is at um, Sarasota. There's my mom and one of the babies. That's probably Joni. And what it looked like here a long time ago, nobody was here. That's me and my mom. She was founder of the Historical Society. We had a monkey that drank beer. Everybody ought to have a monkey that drinks beer. There's a little Australian pine, and there's some um, sea oats. It's my mom and Michael right there at the north end of Longboat Key back in, who knows, you know, for World War II, you know. So that's a house, one of the houses we had in Tampa, and we just sort of, you know, you get an idea of what natives are like and what we did, and that was my great uncle's house that was damaged in a hurricane. There it is after the damage of the hurricane. They just gave it away to people for materials. There's a big shark, great white shark, caught here at Land's End, right? Brought in here, caught off Whitney Beach. That's my aunt and a friend. Bathing beauties. Tampa Yacht Club back in 1900. Good for everybody having the incentive. There's me with a baby alligator, you know? Having, there's me with a rabbit that I shot. So I used to hunt on Longboat Key. People can't believe it. And I was a lifeguard when I first started out as a job. I lifeguarded because uh, I could swim real well. And that was our old boat that we had here at Land's End called the Wind Joe. And we were always going to take it and sail around the world. So here I am talking to you and best wishes to you. And thank you for inviting me. And I hope that... Uh, that this has been uh, interesting for you and I appreciate you having me.